I hold here in my hand two small documents. I treasure them. It's my passport. I have two of them, and the third one is coming next week because I had to renew. This one is the green one, a little larger one that they used to give back in the 60s. When I became involved in church ministry and uh, pastoral work and then departmental work and administration, I uh, was issued my first green passport. Now they have uh, economized and are smaller and uh, they're blue. But I treasure these passports because it gives me entrance back into the United States when I travel out of the country. I treasure them. I was uh, born and I was reared in the border town of Calexico, California. How many of you have ever heard of Calexico? Can I hear? Oh, some of you. Okay, well, it's great. And um, there we have a mission school. And I attended the Calexico Mission School from my first grade on through the 10th grade. The border town, if you don't know, is divided by a steel fence now, but in my days when I was growing up, it was just a little picket fence. That's what divided the two countries, Mexico and the United States of America. And I remember crossing to the Mexican side into Mexico and coming back, all I had to say was American citizen and I would wave through. And now most of the officers in this small community of Calexico knew each other and they knew that I was an American citizen, all these families that lived on the American side. And so they would say, fine, come through. They were our neighbors. Some of the officers were neighbors of ours. I grew up with my grandmother on 3rd Street. The mission school at that time was on 2nd Street. Now it's on 1st Street. And the church was on 2nd Street and still on 2nd Street. So I grew up in the shadow of the church and the mission school. On 1st Street is the border, and you can see right across into Mexico. And every day, every morning, I could hear the reveille of the trumpet as the Mexican flag was raised there by the plaza. So I grew up in this environment. I attended the mission school for the first 10 years of my uh, youth, and then I had to go to the, I, I was sent to boarding academy. But one of the things that has always impressed me as I traveled outside of the United States, it's always good to be home. It's always good to be home. Why do we celebrate the 4th of July? Last or oh, yesterday, those of you that received the Akron, the uh, local newspaper, probably read and uh, you read uh, and saw the editor, uh, the editor's part of the newspaper, the local newspaper. And the question is asked, what do we celebrate on the 4th of July? And uh, three respondents, one, a teenage boy. The day George Washington invented fireworks. <laughs> I thought that was the, the next fellow. The signing of the Declaration of Codependence by Abe Lincoln. And then the third kind of a thoughtful college fellow, looks like, when the British invasion was repelled by Paul Revere and the Raiders. <laughs> God bless America. God bless America. David Reynolds, a historian, writes this, and I'm going to quote, on July 4, 1776, the Continental Congress formally approved the amended Declaration of Independence. Twelve colonies voted in favor, 
New York abstained. The declaration was printed in newspapers throughout the colonies and read out to citizens and soldiers, often accompanied by 13 musket or cannon shots to symbolize the 13 new states. So we celebrate the 4th of July in this country. And thank you very much, Pastor Shuck, for leading us in the singing of the patriotic homes, uh, hymns. Thank you very much. Thank you for the children's story uh, that uh, celebrates our independence. Indeed, this country has been greatly blessed and it has provided a haven of freedom and opportunity for millions of people from around the world. True freedom is not only a concept, but freedom is an experience that makes us and gives us liberty from fear and from subjection to servitude to a power that would deny us who we are and who we were created by God, created in the image of God. So as we celebrate the 4th of July, I would like to share with you for just a few minutes another freedom that we should celebrate every day of our lives, liberty. A beautiful word in any language, libertad in Spanish, liberty in English, libertad in French. In any language, freedom, freedom. What a wonderful gift. Our next door neighbor subscribes to the magazine Country and has a subtitle, The Land and Life We Love. And she shares every issue with us. And this month, the fourth, the month of July, uh, carries a picture in the front page of the magazine. And it's a young boy of 304 holding an American flag in a short white pole. And in the caption are the words, true freedom is the freedom to do what is right. True freedom is freedom to do what is right. I'm going to use as my text this morning, the eighth chapter of John. And if you have your Bibles with you, would you open your Bibles to the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John? Verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you know, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What a tremendous declaration. This morning, the secretary, the new or re-elected secretary of the General Conference spoke, and I saw portions of his sermon, and he alluded to the fact that we are celebrating the 4th of July. Who are we? He asked the question. And he introduced the subject by telling a, an incident that occurred in an airport here in the United States. 
he didn't mention what airport it was, but it was an airport. And people were lining up to get into the plane. And there was a gentleman, well-dressed, well-dressed, tremendous presence, according to the story. And uh, he wanted to break into the line. He wanted to go up to the front. And uh, one of the airport attendants asked him, you have to stand in line, sir. You have to wait in line just like everybody else. You have a ticket. You probably will have no problem boarding the plane. Uh, the man became a bit irritated, and he asked, don't you know or who I am? Don't you know who I am? And uh, the attendant said, sir, you have to stand in line. And again, he said, don't you know who I am? So the attendant went to a microphone and said, attention, ladies and gentlemen, please listen carefully. There is a gentleman on gate 17 who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> and the question I have for you this morning is, do you know who you are? Do we know who we are in the person of Jesus Christ? Do we understand the magnitude of the gospel and the freedom that we have because of Jesus? A event that came ours when we accepted Christ as our personal savior. Freedom, tremendous freedom. I was coming back and crossing the border between Egypt and Israel. I had been to Mount Sinai and I had been to visiting in Egypt. And when I came to, we came to the border between Egypt and Israel, the bus, the touring bus left us about two blocks and we had to take our luggage and walk to the border. When I came to the booth and there was young people because in Israel, all the young people are armed. And uh, I came to the booth, showed my passport and uh, she said, where have you been? Asked the young lady. She was armed. Where have you been? And I said, well, I've been through Egypt and Cairo and so on and so forth. And uh, she said, what are you doing in Israel? What will you be doing in Israel? I said, I'm touring with a group of ministers. Uh, we're touring uh, Israel as well. And then she said something that took me by surprise. She said, what religion are you? And I had to bite my tongue because I was going to answer and say to her, what difference does it make? But then I saw the young people armed and she was armed. And I said, I better hold my tongue. So I just said, I'm a Christian. Oh, she said. I see. And she took, I think it was this passport. She took this passport and stamped it. And she said, you may cross. As Christians, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we have been given Tremendous, tremendous freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. And sin, this little three letter word, is a problem. It's a problem that we all must face and face. And sin is a master. 
sin would enslave and sin deprives us from freedom, from the assurance of freedom. We sang this morning, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace. Do we take time to ponder the meaning of those words and to rejoice in the freedom that we have through the gift of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. That is a tremendous, tremendous gift. The gift of freedom from sin. And Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and he is the truth, of course. And the truth, and he is the truth, shall make you free. Now, what does that mean in our personal walk with Jesus? What does it mean for us to be and to feel and to feel that really through the gift of Christ, the Son of God, We are justified. We are justified. And we're considered to be free. But within this freedom, as I read scripture, and as I read through this chapter, and as I read through the New Testament, especially as I read Paul, this persecutor of the church that came to an encounter with Jesus. This committed follower of God, of Yahweh. And Christ confronts him on the road to Damascus. And Paul, with all his knowledge of the Old Testament, Paul, with all his commitment to the law, faithful to the law, listens to the voice of Jesus that says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he responds as he falls to the ground, blinded by the light. Who are you, Lord? And the voice responds, I am Jesus. <laughs> I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And what a transformation in the life of Paul, who became the evangelist both to the Jews and to the Gentiles, and proclaims to them the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of of freedom, the gospel of forgiveness, the blessed assurance that we can have in Christ, and converting oneself from the slave or a slave to sin, the do loss. And I have to be careful because I know there are biblical scholars here. Slave, the doulos. But, but, there is a transformation in our relationship either 
to sin or to freedom. And that transformation is when we become servants of God, servants of Jesus. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son, a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Glory be to God. Do you have this morning that assurance? Can you walk today and tomorrow and every day in the blessed assurance of freedom and in the blessed assurance of our liberation, of our emancipation, if you will, from sin, the bondage of sin, the insecurity of sin, and we can walk, and we can walk every day, every day, in the assurance of our salvation, the assurance of our salvation. Just this week, someone asked me, Pastor, I have a question for you. And I said, yes. What do I respond when people ask me, are you saved? Are you saved? What would you respond? Or how would you respond? Are you saved? If indeed we have accepted Christ as our Lord and our, and our Savior, then I believe that we can answer in the affirmative by the grace of God. I am saved. I am free. And what a wonderful experience to live our Christian life in that assurance. I am sure you have always been moved as you read the experience and the scene by the Jordan River recorded in John, the first chapter, verses 29 to 31. John comes to the Jordan. I've been to the Jordan where tradition says Paul, I mean John was baptizing, John the Baptist. And I like to imagine the scene as people were gathered around the Jordan. And this strange preacher, John the Baptist, dressed in a different way, and he looks at the multitude that had come to listen to this preacher that had been preaching about sin and the liberation from sin. 
He has been speaking of the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament of the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And comes that moment when a figure comes walking to the border of the Jordan River. And John is in the river. And suddenly I can see the picture unfolding as I read this incident. And I can see the person of Jesus, 27 AD, approach, approaching the Jordan and stepping into the Jordan River. But before he reaches the edge of the flowing river, John stops his preaching. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that includes you and me here today. Praise the Lord. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And my brothers and my sisters, This same Jesus is your Savior and my Savior. This Jesus of whom we sing, this Jesus of whom we preach, this Jesus of whom we proclaim the everlasting gospel. <laughs> Glory be to God. The gospel of salvation, the gospel of freedom. Freedom to make us servants of Jesus and to share him with those around us. And I believe that this continues to be the mission of the church today, sharing Jesus, the proclamation of the gospel of salvation and the message of the soon return of Jesus Christ. I remember that I appeared, Pastor Chuck, before the ordination committee. <laughs> we all have to go through the, that, don't we? <laughs> before the ordination committee. I was a young man just finishing my required three years of internship after school. And I remember someone, one of the pastors asked, young man, how do you understand Jer uh, Revelation 14? Verses one, two, three, and four. I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, I thought a moment, and I said, I believe, I believe that this is the proclamation and will take it as my mission as I am ordained to the ministry. The proclamation of the soon return of Jesus. But the proclamation of the blessed assurance that we can have through the liberty from sin and then into God's marvelous grace. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son and a daughter abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. May this be our song, may this be our hymn in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. May we, we can sing again. And I talked to Pastor Chuck yesterday. Amazing Grace or Blessed Assurance, I'm sorry. Blessed Assurance. What's the number of that hymn? Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the first and the last stanza of this hymn. Four fifty two. Four six two. Shall we stand? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, praising my Savior all day long. Perfect mission, all is addressed. I in my Savior, unhappy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, how grateful we are for the precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of salvation and your righteousness, your justification. Thank you for the joy of serving you. We pray that you will make us wise stewards, that we might share the good news of the gospel, that we might share your soon return when we shall be forever liberated from a world of sin into a world made new where we shall enjoy eternity in a new heaven and a new earth. May this be our blessed assurance and may we walk in that blessed assurance, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.